I'll just say to everyone else, basically, uh, welcome to this. It's the third alumni on Zoom session we've done, but this is an interesting one because we're focusing on one project, which is Chernobyl. Um, we will ask Jacob and Luke a bit of questions about their time at the NFTS, but obviously we'll focus principally on, on the project and talk through it and answer your questions. Um, at the bottom, you'll find a Q&A button. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel free to submit questions that way and we'll answer them live on screen. Um, so yeah, we're just waiting on Luke Hull to join us, who was in a forest this morning having a lovely walk. Um, but came came to my rescue uh, when Jacob asked for a shot of a carpet in a hotel. Luke knew exactly which episode and where it would be. No. <laughs> so he obviously knows very much about his carpets and wall decorations. Um, so who is who are joining us? Who are so at the yes, moment yes. we've got fifty three people who have joined. Oh, us. fantastic! They're a mixture. Oh, Ah, here's Luke. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, so... And, and they can all see us right now. They can all see us. Some will be okay. students, some will be uh, possible students, some will just be young filmmakers, some will be people in the industry. We, it's an entire... Mm, Hello, everyone. Hello. All right, let's check Luke is joining us. Eleanor, Eleonora says hello from Australia. So oh, we're oh, wide. Oh, got two loops. Can, should I get some headphones or a microphone? Can you hear me or? We can hear you perfectly. Okay, uh, great. Is there any problem there? Just checking on Luke there. So the NFTS is closed, I presume. It's all the yeah, the NFTS has moved online for the moment. So yeah. basically we're doing teaching online, but we're hoping to reopen parts of the NFTS in June in phases. So it would, we'd never have everyone on site at one time. We're gonna to have to stagger the start, but yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to get on, on top. Um, okay. This masterclass specifically, though, is open to everyone. So it's not just people from the NFTS. So anyone mm. can tune in. Great. Okay, we've now got three. We've now got three Luke's. He's a very popular man. So you were in class together. Luke, Luke and I were in the same year group. Yes, we spent two years together for all our. Oh, I see. Great. So you graduated in 2000, didn't you? 2001. Yeah. So Luke graduated in 2010. So almost a 10 year okay. gap between the oh, two. Wow. Yeah. Okay. 2010. Mm. Yeah. And is it a two year, is it a still a two year, is it a three years or is it a two year course? The two year <laughs> MA if you're doing uh, cinematography or production design. Mm. Uh, Luke, how are you doing? Can you hear us? Perhaps he's still in the forest. Well, We've got 73 people at the moment. Um, shall I start off by asking you, Jakob, what, what experience had you uh, prior to coming to the NFTS? What, what, kind of, what kind of experience did you have as a DP at that point? Um, well, now when we are talking, now when this discussion is about Chernobyl and stuff, it's quite interesting. It's almost, almost became a full circle for me in life. I started out uh, shooting uh, reconstructions of of, uh, of of crime and of small disasters in Sweden. So we were reconstructing. I worked for this show uh, called um, well, it's like called the America's or Swedish Most Wanted. So it was a crime show where you had to uh, reconstruct these horrible uh, incidents. 
it was a murder or a bank robbery. So I did that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, Friday, I was working for another show called Similar Thing, but you were reconstructing um, accidents. Like if a, a farmer had a, you know, if his tractor fell over him, we had to do a reportage about that. And, um, and that was, I was very young. For some reason, they had given me this camera, this beta camera to, to do this thing. So that was how I started out. The small Chernobyl, so to speak. Um, um, so that's how I started out. Um, and so I had been working for, for five years as a freelance uh, cameraman, mostly in documentaries and in uh, dra a lot of drama documentaries. So with that, I kind of made a, a showreel um, and applied for, um, well, to the film school. Um, I hadn't really, I'd done some, com some um, music videos, but mostly it was really documentaries and drama documentaries. Um, and like a, maybe a five year uh, working experience as a, I, I mean, I don't know, I was not a DOP in a sense, I worked, you know, it was just me and an assistant, you know, and then we had some redheads and a few, you know, HMIs and, and, uh, and the director was a journalist often, uh, who was not really interested in, in the reconstruction, they just wanted to do the interviews and to do a, you know, a reportage. Um, yeah, so that's how I started out. Mm. And uh, what age were you when you applied to the NFTS then? Uh, I was 24, right. I think, which I think was one of the youngest Yeah. Uh, sure. at the time. Me and Balash Bolygo, who was in my year, he was also, I think, we were both born in 75. Oh, wow. So okay. I started when I was 18 almost, um, anyway. Oh. So, well, now our youngest is 21. He's from Iceland. I don't know if he's oh, wow. him, but he is the youngest we've ever accepted onto the cinematography. Okay. Um, yeah, our little baby of the year group. Um, so at the, your time, it was a three-year MA. Well, uh, it, no, it was actually two. It just switched within my year. After the first year, they kind of told us it was became a two year. But in the end, I did three years because of other circumstances. But um, okay, we we were the first ones who who were not officially doing three years. So then, but when it, you when you graduated, how easy did you find it to enter the industry? I mean, what what was your process for getting that initial job and? and find an agent? Um, you're breaking up a bit now, but um, not the, if you ask me about the process, yes. Well, it, it was, um, you know, I lived in, in London, of, you know, and, uh, and you, know, you have Soho, which was this little European Hollywood where all the production companies are in their tiny offices. So it was, um, it was like a catwalk, so to speak. You were walking around in Soho with your with your showreel, with your uh, geometric tape of things that you cut together. Um, lots of material from the film school, but also what I've done previously. And you walked with that one, and you had nothing to lose, really. You were just knocking on doors saying hello, and we want to see what I've done during my years at the NFTS. And uh, and people were all very friendly and welcoming, and. And I remember I often said that I'm from the NFTS, in, you know, and I kind of believed that, I still believe that that was a good kind of key into, or way into the, into the industry. And, um, and I had made a, a graduation film and, and an agent uh, kind of uh, contacted me after seeing that graduation film. So quite quickly, uh, I managed to, um, uh, to find an agent. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm just WhatsApping Luke, who's having some technical problems. He's saying that uh, Zoom is for some reason asking him to update. So he's, okay, okay. he's, he's trying to get in. Um, does anyone have any specific questions they want to ask Jakob about the time at the NFTS? I'm just going to see before we move on to the actual Chernobyl. Nope. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. So let, let's move on to Chernobyl then. 
So how did this project arrive at your, your doorstep for all intents and purposes? Uh, yeah, that's, um, I had just uh, been in Hungary, in Budapest, for three four months, uh, prepping a film, uh, a, a wow. studio film with the... Uh, Luke's with arrived. A, right. Hello, right. <laughs> Hello, Luke. Hi. I think we got trapped in that uh, forest. Work it. I mean, that works normally every time. I think I had to update. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, right, so Jakob was just telling us how he, uh, the project of Chernobyl arrived at his door, and then we'll ask you the same question. Okay. Yes. Right. So, um, hello, Luke. Hi. Now I can see you. I don't see you. Uh, I don't see you, Bruce, but you know, I see Luke, but that's maybe okay also to see Luke. Who should I look at? Oh, now I see you. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> but, but you keep on switching. Now I see lovely Luke again. I don't know, but that's okay. I mean, it's, just... As the microphone picks us up, it will change the camera. <laughs> okay, okay. It's like, it's like DJing. Okay, but um, yeah, so I was in Hungary prepping this film, which was um, quite a large film uh, with a very kind of uh, big cost. Um, and suddenly that kind of didn't happen. Um, so I came home to Stockholm and in that time, uh, this film called Thelma, which I shot with Joachim Trier, who directed it, uh, who's a fellow NFTS uh, graduate. That film just came out and it was showing in, in all over the world, but with a limited release, but it was showing in New York. So you know, I emailed all my friends in New York to please go and see this little European or, you know, fairly small European film, um, and I emailed the Johan Renk, who I had been in touch with about other projects that never worked together before, but we had been in touch and kind of tried to work together. And, um, and I told him, you know, please go out and see this film. And, uh, and he answered me straight away and said, oh, by the way, I was just thinking of you. Are you, you, know, are you interested in this project I'm doing? And um, maybe we can meet, if you're interested, we can meet in a couple of days. I'm in London, I live in New York normally. We can meet in three days if you like the script. So suddenly I read this script and, um, and I remember reading the last, the last episode on the plane, just going into this meeting. Um, so that's how I came into the meeting. And I guess, um, I don't know even if you one was, but you never really on these shows, I realized you're never really the first choice always. You know, I, I don't know if I was a second, third, or fourth. I don't know really, but you know, it's uh, you never know. Um, but in case, but this was at a short notice. I think they had, I think they had trouble um, kind of um, uh, to get kind of a, a clearance of the kind of office number one choice to speak. For some reason, they didn't have the the, the, the clearance from HBO, or, or, and maybe I was also lucky that I had worked on on this in the studio movie in, in Hungary, which didn't happen. And I guess that looked kind of good on the CV if they wanted kind of bigger productions on your, under your belt. Yeah. Luke, how, how did Chernobyl arrive at your... By the way, Luke and I, are, we, we were in the same year group together, um, but we've actually not seen each other in 10 years, probably. We speak that, by WhatsApp, that, but it's very... That, that is true, actually, yeah. Those 10 years have gone very quickly, though. Yeah, you don't know, you don't exactly I've got less hair, you've got the same hair, so you're doing fine. The same hair, I did cut it myself the other day, so with very yeah, good looking just, just like normal. Um, <laughs> uh, so how did Chernobyl arrive at your, your doorstep? It, it, that's a good question. It didn't arrive. I think it's, um, I think I just finished Howard's End and um, we were looking for looking to see what to do next really and I, uh, this project came it was one of the first projects that actually came through the agency through Casarotto and um, read it I don't think I don't think anyone thought that it was necessarily a possibility it was because uh, at the time I think there was another designer already attached to it there was already a feasibility study going on um, but the script and it was only the pilot at the time that I had um, was really good I mean it's really uh, it sounds really obvious thing to say but actually it's quite rare um you can get many scripts that you just suddenly want to read them really quickly and in one go so um it is just a project that really captured my imagination anyway so we kind of sort of chased it as well but then on top of that um 
somehow, don't ask me how, my name had appeared on a list at Sister Pictures and Chris Fry was keen to meet. And uh, it was just one of those chance meetings, really, where I went in and sort of pitched an idea of the project based on what I'd read, not really knowing um, what had already been discussed prior. And um, it seemed to get everyone really excited. And it was a kind of step-by-step -step process. So I sort of met Jane at Sister and then, then, then it was a little earlier than when I think Johan had joined the project. And then eventually when Johan joined, it was a case of meeting him and then Craig Mazin, all via Zoom calls like this, actually, because we're from different parts of the world. Um, and in terms of just trying to explain what we, what I felt the project could be, this is before I'd found out that it was, um, had already been costed up as a much smaller project. We, we made it quite large, much larger actually. But, and then actually it went away. Um, it went quiet. And I thought it must have gone to someone else. I actually went and did a feature in Morocco with a really um, lovely director called Vicky. And, um, and it was actually where I was at in uh, Morocco. It was about two weeks before the end of filming that. that I got a call saying, can you fly to Lithuania to meet Johan Renk? <laughs> and I said, no, <laughs> in the middle of filming. And it was so, um, I missed meeting Johan at the week in Lithuania and flew, I think, two weeks later from Morocco to Paris to Lithuania. I did a recce came back and um, it was one of those weird things where you just start doing the job it was kind of and, uh, and then I met Johan a bit later in person but we but again like Jakob who never knows who knows if you're the first choice well I'm sure there's many people on that list um, but what I can say is that since since getting that initial pilot to when all the other HODs were before, Project, the addition of the project moved quite dramatically, only from just a pitch point of view, and HBO were really behind it, which was great. So, I mean, were you both definitely wanting to do the job? Was there any apprehension? Was there any nerves from your side about the scale of the project or the subject matter or whether it would work out or whether it could be achieved in the budget? Or um, yeah. For me, it was a, a bit of a no-brainer. I was uh, instantly kind of intrigued by the project on paper, and even more so by Johan. And to be honest, as every HOD came on, it just became a stronger project. So, um, I think what worried me more was that we wouldn't be able to achieve the scale that was in my mind. I think we were trying to be, I think there was a feeling to be quite conservative with the, with the initial budget. Uh, set up for the project if I'm completely honest and, and we did kind of spend a few weeks rethinking and costing what the project could be and showing what that could be and and I think that's rare and that's where HBO were really great I think because um, you know they, they, it was definitely the budget increased um, I mean I don't think it's, it's, it's really I mean what was on the page was really ambitious and so you want to meet that ambition um, and it wasn't necessarily about making big sets for the sake of making big sets. It was about getting scope into television because this story was really about people and following people through this journey and, and trying to be with them as much as possible. And so to, to get that kind of scope, we really needed a bit more scale. I mean, having said that, it wasn't a massive amount of money, but um, so it was the opposite, really. I wasn't intimidated by the scale of the project, more... Um, a constant eye on whether it could be achieved to the level that we imagined it, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, for me, I've never done television before, you know, apart from, you know, many, many years ago when I was in my early uh, 20s. So since then, I had never really done television. And I was, you know, it was an amazing and extremely well written and writing and fascinating script, but at the same time, I was concerned about being that is, you know, being a television show. That uh, how will it be um, screened and who will watch this? Will it just end up as a as a thumbnail on a little uh, HBO portal? I mean, you know, will it be a proper premiere? I, you know, I, I've been so into. Um, into uh, f films uh, that's been shown at festivals and you have you know had some amazing premieres and there been some reviews and there might be in smaller films but they always got a lot of you know, attention in, in, a, in their little own little world and i was very concerned or worried that maybe what's the point doing this if it won't be seen <laughs> I, you know i was very wrong of course but um, so at first i was not sure really and, and also to go away for so long for eight months almost um, I was I, it took me a while to really 
to say yes to this in a, almost in a spoiled way, you know. And, but that's like that with every project almost that you do. With you just almost say no at first, saying this is just impossible in terms of logistics. And but then, of course, you, you yeah, you're realizing that you know, this is a, especially with this project, this is really a chance of a lifetime to um, to do a you know portrait of you know, of mankind. You know, it's it's uh, yeah. it's um, yeah, it was really a no-brainer in that sense. So when you both signed on to the project was that at that point had any designs been done had there been any pre-production or or was i mean did you do location scouts together we eventually yeah i mean i think i probably started a bit earlier um the uh i mean what was unique was we knew there was one director and the same dp it's unusual in television sometimes to get the, the coherence of the same actually to do the project so once we were all together, that that we we did scout a lot together, yeah, and that that certainly was a huge part of for me anyway the creative process of kind of how we pieced together the aesthetic of this. But I mean, we were based out in Lithuania. I mean, we did a I did a few scouts for Lithuania to begin with on my own because I mean to be honest, quite honest, I wasn't sure about the choice. That was pretty much the only choice that was made before me starting, I think, um, and that and the, some sort of feasibility study that we essentially threw out the window. So. Uh, inheriting Lithuania was kind of a big um, concern for me at the beginning, but it actually panned out really well. Great crew to a certain extent out there in, in good locations, but what it lacked was scale. So we pushed further, basically. We went to Kiev and we looked at Moscow and we looked at other countries and we ended up settling in Kiev. But certainly I think by the time the new year came around, you were on board, right, Jakob? And we were, we were relatively scouting together, getting into places, not necessarily always to use as a location, actually, just to get us a feel for it. Yeah, I mean, that was incredible. Uh, I feel that they took us on board uh, this May so early. I was there mm -hmm. already in December and then I had a break for Christmas and then I came back in January and did so much scouting and, and, and with that, so much talking. And, and that was uh, mm -hmm. the main thing. It was actually, it was, the, the talking was almost better than scouting. I mean, we had so much time to discuss. At least, of course, Luke had so much to prepare and build, but for me, uh, I felt I really had time with you know Luke to listen into his plans and to just listen to you one in his kind of scout car, you know, to, to sit with him and just, <laughs> listen just to his, uh, the music that he made as uh, well. <laughs> so listen yeah. to tracks in the car when we were going on scouts, get a sense yeah, of that's true. <laughs> So, so that was the key, I think, to uh, that we all became such um, yeah, such a, a close-knitted uh, team that we had so much time together and uh, we were all kind of stranded on this uh, island but stranded in you know in a foreign country away from everyone else and and we all were on this special mission to you know to inform and to inform the world about this disaster so everyone was really i never seen so many uh, people being kind of so dedicated to this and you know, we had a, a German SFX team, and uh, our sound team came from France, and and uh, they were all. They said, "Well, yeah, we just left everything behind. We left our families behind in Paris and Berlin, and we could have done, you know, another TV show in, you know, in Paris or in, in Berlin. But we, you know, we had to tell the story. This is for my. I'm doing this for my children, many as people said. So, uh, and they were all with us in the scouting. So they, they were good in that sense. Uh, as the production company or that they produce it that to get everyone involved so early and of course that was a cost factor for them but they realized you know that let's get everyone together as soon as possible and was it always structured as five episodes at that point was it yes yeah. yes yeah the scripts are always five yeah I, I think we had yeah and at any point did you go to actually chernobyl or did you I mean, you obviously can't go to it, but you know, you can, you can, you can tour the plant in a restricted fashion and you can go to Pripyat. Um, I didn't end up going, I, th I think it was a choice not to go to Chernobyl power station itself because there's nothing informative there in the sense that we were making a story set in the eighties. We weren't making what it looks like now. Um, and, um, and also I mean, it was interesting. I mean, I'm going to call before this goes back to that question of authenticity is like we weren't seeking to document this but make something that felt uh like you 
believed that you were watching it and immersed in it. So it was actually about more working with what we were going to use and, and, and the power plant at Ignalina. So um, there was an option and there was an option to go to Pripyat. And actually, I, the the second option to go to Pripyat, I was keen to go and it was, a, it was when we were in Kiev, I think, and there was a big fire and we didn't go. So I never made it up. I'm almost embarrassed to say and yet also wouldn't encourage anyone to go either. <laughs> but, I don't know, Jakob, did you go? I can't remember. No, I mean, of course, we, we all wanted to go, I think, to pay, you kind know, of tribute and to show our, uh, you know, to get our last, uh, kind of, not blessing, but to, you know, pay respect before, you know, reconstruct to make this alive again. So that was a plan to go there, and I was meant to fly the Johan, I think. Mm. But like Luke said, it was on fire. The forest around was on fire and spreading the activity again. So. So uh, I mean, I shouldn't laugh about it. It's horrible. But so in the end, uh, <laughs> it's so in the end, so in the end, we didn't go. But I think we had a second unit who went there. Um, months, yeah, spent, yeah, months. months went up. Hmm. An amazing second unit on 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 the film um, Swedish director Mons Monson and a DP, Finnish DP called JP Passi. They went for some second unit work. I'm not sure how much of that was used in the end, but. Um, yeah. I think it was used in the epilogue at the end, it was sort of shots of Pripyat now. Yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, the, the the trial, for example, wasn't take, didn't take place in Pripyat. It was actually Chernobyl towns further out. You can go there, um, and yeah. So it's 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 negligible as to whether you know it would have been useful. It was like I like said, it's more out of respect. One one thing I did do that was quite moving, I suppose, is when we did a week in Moscow at the end. I was sort of I stayed in Moscow and I went to visit the um, where they buried the firemen. That was pretty. That was that. Yeah, that was interesting actually. In some way. So, how long was the actual shoot for the? I mean, how long would it, how long would it, did it take to shoot an episode, or did you not break it up in that way? No, it was like something like 26, 28 weeks, something like that, wasn't it? I mean, 110 days, I think. 110 uh, mm-hmm. shooting days with with, um, with the main unit, and I'm not sure 25 of second unit. The second unit definitely grew, especially when yeah. we were doing the um, Pripyat evacuation stuff. That was um, that was interesting, and and the Kiev. I mean, we got a lot in Kiev really for two weeks of filming in Kiev or whatever it was. We had, a, I think, second unit every day out there. So, um, but I, I do remember it was a long shoot. Longer than I suppose you'd expect for television. I mean, it depends on the kind of show, but uh, it was again the, one of the benefits of having one director oversee the whole project was, was that it felt like there was. I mean, the it was always tight. Everything's tight that you do, but this there was some room to breathe. You know, one of the things I love most about the show is that all of the, the details that you managed to capture in a day, and I don't know how you found the time to do that. Yeah, well, that was quite incredible. Of, 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 there was an eye opener, uh, many ways to work with the second unit, um, which I haven't done that much before. And it was interesting to see our first AD, and I was so impressed uh, how well he was able to construct the days of the week. I was always thinking, how, how does he manage to make these perfect days all the time to fit the, fit the right amount of scenes? Um, but of course, every time you know, they became too full, uh, we, we gave it to the second unit. And of course, you know, we were aware of that, but I never worked so closely with the second unit and, 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 and so closely and, and being so you know, grateful for what the amazing thing that they, they did. So that for me was a big kind of change to have um, a second unit who being such, taking such a big part of, of the show. Um, the same goes with the VFX team. Um, normally you have it, yeah. not normally, but in general the VFX, they're not with you so much and they're not as dedicated at this as as Lindsay um, was as a VFX supervisor. But one, that goes once again, the nature of the project, that it was more than just a TV show. It, you know, we, we were all had, we all, it was almost a kind of religious or some kind of um, very strong belief that this was, uh, this was one off. This was more than, more than just, a, this is not entertainment or, or it's about you know, uh, giving a, creating a message. I think when I was chatting, to look about Chernobyl, uh, I thought it was largely locations, but there were quite a lot of sets. Mm. I mean, how, how much do you think was sets in percentage terms? Well, we had about 260 
sets, set area, if you like. So split between locations and sets for about 60, 40, if you want to put a percentage on it, but 40% set. But the, um, I think that the thing that I'm always <laughs> amazed about is there's only even a single location that we went to and we turned up and used it as it was. I mean, maybe some, certainly that tiled space in episode five when like asked off is thinking he's going to be shot. I think we pretty much took that as it was. But um, no, I mean, there was a lot of set and you had to. I mean, we, it's still a period piece. You know, it's, it's the 80s, but it's still period and it's you still need a, an immense amount of control. And, and I think what excited me about the script was we felt we had to hold on to was this ability to have the option even if we didn't use it of being able to follow and move with people that meant bigger more controlled spaces so i mean all of that interior power plant the exterior power plant which is all set maybe that's not obvious i don't know the roof and everything that was all on a back lot that we had to create because we don't really have a studio out there i mean we found a shell of a building and it was perfect because we kind of built into and through the stage you'd have these kind of composite sets um, but then we also built things like the Kremlin conference room because it was just, it would have been wrong to go to somewhere as a location and, and especially somewhere that was a bit more, um, glamorous, should we say, in terms of its decor, because it just would have stood out in the, the sort of look that we were going for. Um, so it was just some, a lot of things on the control, I mean, the control room of the power plant, that was a, a very complicated set, but it was less complicated than doing on location in the end because you needed to be able to i don't think we would have got the day i think we shot that in six days in Jacob, and if we had to do it in a way that where we hadn't been able to run the program and be able to pick up it anywhere you know at any point with the various light displays and things like that we would have had to start at the beginning each time so um I mean, I could keep listing sets. I mean, there was some fun ones like the pipe room, obviously, that I mean, where the divers go under, which is a complete kind of mythic fantasy sort of hell hole of a, uh, an idea, just more of a tonal kind of representation of what was going on in the story at that time. And then there was ones that we wanted to be very, very um, authentic with, like the trial, um, which is, it might as well be a set. I mean, these are locations, but you end up changing them so much that they become sets. So, yeah, I, I, I think there's a fair amount. Like I said, we went to Kiev for locations, really interesting, or locations of scale. Um, but when we're in Lithuania, we, we built or cre at least created a lot. So. Well, I'm going to start bringing in some questions because we've got some questions for both of you. So I'll, I'll start asking them. So I'll start with one of the uh, about the interior concept, is there a progression of decay? For example, the glamour of the Kremlin at the beginning and the decay of the final trial. If the answer is yes, which was the, what? Which was the reason? That's from Helena. Is that for me or Jacob? Sorry. That's for you, Luke. Oh, okay. Sorry, I missed that. You cut out at the beginning. Sorry. Um, no, I, 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 not consciously. I think. Um, I think the whole thing was more about having a pervading, sickening tone that ran through the whole thing. Was, when you could do shows like this, particularly these TV shows, they have such a high number of sets. Or you, the biggest fear on my part, or the biggest thing that you want to keep an eye on is coherence across the whole thing. Obviously, you want your various contrasts within, like, but, but yeah. if, if something is just thrown in for visual sake, sometimes it can stand out. So. Um, no, I think it was more about creating contrast between when we're in Moscow and when we're back at the plant. So this sense of decay and this sense of kind of a loss of direction or loss of spatial understanding when we're in, particularly in the power plant and in and, and around Pripyat kind of made sense to me. But then when we were in Moscow, it was more structured and bureaucratic and clean and sterile, I suppose, slightly removed like uh, from the from the stuff on the ground. So. It was, it was less, I mean, maybe Yagal and Johan may have discussed this, but we certainly never had a conversation about wanting a kind of journey of decay over the episodes. I think it was more no. about finding differences, yeah. Okay, we've got one for Jakob. Uh, what kind of shots would usually go to the second unit and how would you make sure you get the shots shot in the way that made you happy? Uh, yeah, it's... Um... I mean, in the end of the shots without the main cast, I mean, they were not really allowed to, or not allowed, but they were not meant to shoot anything with the main cast. Uh, I mean, the, the three of them, um, uh, the main three, I guess, that was the main thing. And, and it was 
Yeah, so that was, so they didn't do any big scenes as such. Uh, there were a lot of amazing cutaways. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, one of my favorite shots in the film or favorite, one of the strongest shots is of this uh, deer lying in the forest. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it kind of tilts up and you see, the, you see the, the trees and there's a helicopter passing by. And I remember reading that in the script before my meeting with the producers before I had the, you know, I was signed on, so to speak. I remember that scene being so strong, and there were many of those. And I think it would be fantastic to shoot that. And that then went to second unit. And um, so there are many shots like that, kind of um, one shots, one off shots. Um, but in order to get happy, it's all about for me to be pleased, or to me to feel okay to, to pass that over to someone else. It's about uh, you know casting or finding the right. Um, director and the right DP and, and I know Mons Monson, the director of the second unit from before and he's done some amazing, amazing uh, smaller Swedish films, very obscure ones, but they are very, very strong and and uh, and, and we never worked together but I was always very you know, inspired by his work and I recommended him to Johan, to Johan Reng and we all met and so, so um, and then in order to find the DP together with Mons, because um, we had a relationship with, with uh, yeah, since before, then we tried to cast the right DP for the film. So I was very much, or I had to be very much part of that process. And, and once again, to make them feel not like a second unit, to make them feel like, like all of us, like fellow filmmakers uh, doing this together. Um, and then uh, we also throughout you know, our show had some rules or, or some, um, uh, you know, way we wanted to go visually. And of course, they were very aware of that and they knew what, you know, what we didn't want. And, but it was not never talk about we and them, you know, we were all very incorporated and all very, you know, part of the team. So was there a visual Bible or something that they had to follow, a guidelines or? Well, not really. I never wrote that down as such, but we just, you know, talked a lot. We had so much time. Like I said, we were, always, we were stranded there in Vilnius. In, in, and so we had really time to talk and, and go through things. And, uh, and uh, we had, yeah, so, yeah, there, there was, of course, like on any project, we had some, you know, this is what we want to do. Maybe there's some lenses, this is a lighting style, this is uh, how the camera should move and all that stuff. So, so that was discussed. and and. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah. Okay, so we've got a, a question for both of you. Uh, can you each chat about your prep process, what it usually looks like for Chernobyl specifically from your first read to your second read, breaking down the script, generating ideas, talking them through with people, and then obviously the execution on the set. Mm. We'll start with Luke. Oh, good. Uh, <laughs> vast question um i think it, it, it well first of it definitely changes her job like my well my approach anyway just depending on it has to i think you have to adapt i mean but obviously yes i tend to read it all and then before i even do a breakdown i mean to, to read it and then read it again so you just kind of have a, have a kind of a, a reaction to it and then um and then, there, then there's a sort of breakdown i mean obviously i have a team so i, I bought karen on the supervising art director quite early um, Claire didn't start that far behind the set decorator. So between us all, we're, we're kind of going through that process to sort of try and rough out some sort of budget and structure to it. Um, it was, one, I mean, it was kind of weird. So with this one in particular, then we had sort of a six week pre prep in London uh, with a couple of art directors, me and Karen, and, and I'd been out to Lithuania and we were trying to tackle the big things. So like how we would deal with the power plant without losing scope. Three, I mean, the thing is three miles long and you want to show and tell that story. And it's, it was really a bit of a, a conundrum as to how we were going to do that. And so um, we, a lot of that process and, and I don't, yeah, I mentioned Lindsay, the VFX producer as well. He started um, early and, uh, and we were able to, well, what we did in the art department anyway, is we sort of modeled Chernobyl, we modeled Ignalina, the power plant we, we had hoped at the time we were going to use, we, still, we still didn't know at the time. But, and, um, and then we uh, extrapolated the sets that we wanted to build from that as well. We found out like splice points. We kind of did all of this sort of brain game work on the power plant quite early up front in those six weeks, because that was a kind of given that, you know, wouldn't be affected by location or whatever. Um, 
and then started to break out what other sets would you want to build and and then i mean in the meantime constantly scouting as well i think what you know I mentioned before like the thing that i noticed very quickly was that there was a large chunk of the project that wasn't going to be accommodated in lithuania and that was everything that would require scale or certainly the sort of really interesting kind of soviet interiors from a design through to dressing approach we didn't want to make an 80s period film i really wanted to make a soviet film <laughs> so um and uh, and equally, we didn't want to make a Western cliche of that. We didn't want to make a Russian nostalgia version of that. We we wanted to make something that totally represented the story and the and the, uh, the kind of focus on the characters, I suppose, and the people of the story. Um, there's a lot of individual bravery in this. And um, so then, yeah. So the mixture of like that planning process of six weeks. Then we we all moved out to Lithuania in January, and it was a bit like starting again because then you're dealing with things on the ground and reality. And then obviously I've got a department and you kind of divide sets across various art directors, some of which were local. And um, yeah, I mean, a lot of that early prep inspiration came for, for me as all, uh, actually probably with nearly every project, is trying to do as much scouting as possible because you can't, if you try and imagine everything, you kind of end up coming up with obvious things. So like, it's always nice to have something to fight against and find it in the location if possible. And, um, I mean, it's pretty easy to say on this one, we probably got into it nearly everywhere we had, we could get into in Lithuania. It's not a big country. And, um, and likewise in Kiev, we did a lot of scouting, even places that we didn't end up filming. But I mean, it was particularly interesting getting into people's apartments in the sleeping districts in Kiev really started to inform like Ludmilla's apartment and things like that. So, um, and then it's in particular because we had a, a team early on and one team doing every episode, like Jakob says, we did a lot of talking, I was able to spend time with Johan, um, not necessarily always talking about the project, to be honest, just trying to get a sense of what his approach is and, and what he likes and what we disagreed on and agreed on. Uh, with Odile, the costume designer, I mean, that was huge on this because she had such a huge undertaking. I think she made every single costume. Um, I'm really not answering this question very well, but I mean, I guess if I sum it up, I start usually with tonal images and I try to keep it very contained, like a few boards that tell the, the aesthetic that I'd like to take in the direction of. And then as we start collecting things, I have to get it all on the wall because that's the only way I can see it all together. And I know if something's not working and you sort of start to piece it together like a collage basically and always looking all the time. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, I could. I mean, it's such a vast question. I think I should let Jakob explain his his side of it. Over to you, Jakob. What what kind of what's your approach to prep in terms of that first draft onto? Well, well, I try to stay away from prep as as long as possible. <laughs> I try to to. Uh, I mean, I love prep. It's almost the best part of filming somehow. But I try to not take a kind of professional stand and try to read it and uh, relive it as a as a normal person as long as possible. I try to stay away from the the kind of the professional eye for as long as I can and and. And they also helped us with that. They, you know, once you were on board the project, you had this had access to this amazing um, archive uh, library of, of, of sources. If, if it was uh, links to articles and also to some books that we should read and YouTube clips, and there was so much material that we that we started to read about uh, about Chernobyl and about the Soviet Union. So for me, it, it like most projects, you dive into things which are not to do nothing to do with cinematography as such and, and you do that in order to not to get any um, I try to at least not to get not to get carried away uh, with the cinematography just to try to get okay let's get as much information as possible before I make these decisions so it so it was a lot about that uh, reading 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 and especially this book uh, by Svetlana Alexievich she received a Nobel Prize some years ago called the TS for Chernobyl or the different the titles of the translation, but it's called Tears for Chernobyl. And uh, so it was that, and then getting to know you one, uh, spending a lot of time with him. And what was quite unusual with this project, um, that he was, I, I guess, uh, he's not from a film school as such. And I don't know if that's really the reason, but he, I don't think he's used to, I find a director from the film school, they are used to, uh, or they try to find a partner in crime, uh, find a DP or production designer that they try to 
work closely with and try to be uh, not loyal to, but they often work together. At least that's how I work with the films I've shot. Many of them are, you know, directors have worked a lot for many years. Um, but I don't think Johan is from that background. He's always kind of been left, maybe left alone, so to speak, or has been on every project he has to, he has to take full responsibility as a director and maybe hasn't been able to, to count on his DP or, or production designer. He had to do things on himself. So, so what he did, he did a short list for, for all the five episodes. He sat down, closed the door, and I said, you want me to be part of the shortlisting? And he said, uh, well, let's, let me just do a shortlisting. I might not have seen the locations and I don't know exactly what they're doing, but I'll do a little shortlist. And he did that uh, for everything. And that was a big kind of a, a roadmap for us, for Luke and everyone involved knowing, okay, this is what we want to achieve. These are the shots. And it sounds very basic, but he did that. He was very you know, ambitious and, and and, um, and great with that and sharing that with us. And, and from then on, we could improvise and, and find new ways and, and many times, or sometimes there was no shortlist because there was no location, but at least it was up for discussion. So, so that was, uh, that helped us in the pre-production. And then I'm spending a lot of time in the, in the rental house, spending a lot of time in the rental house and, and uh, doing tests. And maybe what really helped was to have a test day uh, where we shot for, for two days, we did some, not a short film, but I set up a little scene. This was without you one, but I did a little scene with some stand-ins and some extras and with using the crew. And that was, a, that's always a nice, I tried to do it more. It was a nice icebreaker, so to speak, to do that first little scene, like two weeks before the shoot, you do a little, uh, some scenes, um, which will give you a hint towards what you want to achieve. Um, Maybe I'm rambling here a bit, but uh, I mean, you yeah. shot you shot Chernobyl on digital. Was there ever a consideration that you would shoot it on film, and and how did you go about choosing the lenses that you would end up shooting Chernobyl on? Yeah, but we didn't. We, it's kind of quite early. They said uh, it's digital. It has to be, and and the director. In order to shoot film, you have to have the director on your side. And I felt you one was very. He was. He didn't want to fight that. Uh, that battle and said, let's shoot, let's shoot digital. And, um, and then early on we thought, let's just like production design, let's make this as authentic and real as possible and let, let the camera become the Soviet Union. So, so for a while we thought of anamorphic lenses, even Russian old Soviet lenses. And we thought of using a Alexa studio with a mechanical shutter to make it even more mechanic or more robotic, whatever, if that, you know, is this, if that stands for the Soviet Union to have something more heavy and mm -hmm. and uh, mechanical and using glass, a lot of lot of pieces of glass to make it like the, the viewer, the eye of the Soviet Union. So that was the first idea we had. And, you know, we had looked at uh, Tarkovsky and, you know, I saw, I remember seeing Andrew Rublev at the film school, like in white film shot anamorphic uh, by Tarkovsky. And so we were kind of going in that direction. But then, like I said, they had a long period of pre-production and suddenly you start to realize that maybe we don't have, maybe this is the wrong approach, actually. We did more research, read more history, read more about the characters. And then we realizing that's, I think this is a wrong approach. We shouldn't become the apparatus. We shouldn't become the machinery. The camera should move away from that and be someone on the ground instead. And that's when we went away from that idea and, and went the spherical. And not anamorphic and went with the lighter camera and and we almost tried to make something less grand and operatic um, so that's once again the long pre-production time makes you you know rethink you make u turns and 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 it's important to be very uh, to be very honest and to um, and 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 you realize that these theories might sound good, but then when you do your test, you realize that this doesn't look right. You know, you know, we even thought of shooting spherical lenses with very normal glass, with very kind of modern glass, and we wanted to get, get away from this vintage look. So we thought from very early on, when we had decided to shoot spherical, to shoot with ultra primes, which are these very clean, good lenses. So we like that idea to let's find a view, way to not to interfere with the, with the sets or with the, with the story. Let's just shoot on normal plain glass. Let's not have any artifacts. But then when we did our lens tests, 
we realized saying, hey, well, it doesn't look right for some reason. And we realized that this vintage glass that they had kind of decided not to do use, we realized that that's, that's the way to go. That, that gives us kind of something felt, we, we felt something with, with that glass. Um, so um, it's a pre-production time where you go, go back and forth and try out things and, um, and um, yeah. Um, I've got some stills from Chernobyl that you asked me to show. Uh, some very interesting ones. I'm not sure why you picked them, but I'm, I'm uh, but uh, I'm curious also about color palettes. I'm going to try sharing my screen. And hopefully, this is going to work. Uh, can you guys see photos? Uh, yes. Okay. Oh yes, that that thing was amazing. We bought. So, this is a fascinating piece of art in the background. Actually a map. It's um, a map. And that came from a really obscure reference. I can't remember. There was a few things that we, did. we shared reference constantly. Um, and it was a really good way of working with Johan actually, because he started off with a kind of, I guess, a, well, a sort of collage of tonal images and I had some as well and then as we went I just would ping him maybe every other week sort of like strong images that just resonated whatever that meant one of them was actually it's not this literally it's so abstract but it, it was a really someone standing in front of this massive map and it felt like some sort of mural and so that's actually a map of um, Chernobyl in the sort of th three kilometer zone um, pieced together from actual uh, sourced maps of the we sort of made our own but it was obviously based on that um and that they're sitting inside this uh, sort of water cabin thing that we bought and then uh, we sort of repainted and had to do a lot but um it's a yeah, smaller it, set it's, a, it's almost a smaller set on Chanel, but it was a real oh water God, cabin yeah. and it was hot wasn't it yeah, very hot um, <laughs> but maybe yeah so how, do, how did you two discuss color palette? Because, it, it, I mean, Chernobyl has got a very distinctive color palette. Uh, there, there is a predominant color which seems to be green throughout the project. But there's yeah, also so these mm -hmm. little hints of color from the yellow telephone on the, on the table to just little bits here and there. So uh, what, what discussions did you guys have about the actual color palette? I'm, I'm presumed with the director, obviously. But you know, in, in creating the visual identity of the show? Um, I think, again, it's informed by images of the Soviet Union, images that resonated, 80s images that were taken in those times, and also doing location scouting. Like, this green is very Soviet. I mean, it's also one of Johan's favorite colors, which helps. I mean, it just, no, we, we must have talked about it <laughs> a lot, but there was, um, I think we just sort of, again, when you spend a lot of time together, you, you sort of get an understanding of what everyone is, is liking. Um, it was also a sense for me, like I guess I was always trying to think of this, what is slightly sickening and off. Um, it just, just it was an interesting idea to pursue anyway. Um, we, we did, yeah. well, I don't know, we, we, um, we um... I don't know if this is a good example of that one, but I, I had been in Odessa 10 years or more prior to, to being in, in the Ukraine. I was during my time in film school, I did a short film called Dust. This was shot in, in Odessa and, and that's a documentary. Um, and that documentary was kind of a stylized in the sense that it was shot on tracks instead of handheld, but it was also shot with a heavy uh, blue green filter. Mm. Um, we saw all our footage on, on that film is quite blue green and I remember shooting our first week in the apartment of Legasov, it was meant to be in Moscow, we had the screen walls and everything but it still looked, I remember it still looked, it didn't look real and for me the re reality for me was what I had experienced in Odessa, this was in 2000, and, yeah, in 2000. And, and so when I played around with the LUTs on the Alexa I found a lot which looked a bit like the Odessa I had seen, you know, 18 years earlier almost. And but of and which had a little an extra blue green cast to it. And but of course, 
that was not real either because the reality that I was referring to had also been manipulated in documentary with this blue green filter. But but it's interesting how projects, I don't know, how previous projects kind of interfere, not interfere, but how it kind of um, messes up with your own perception of reality. Mm. But um, but it's true. The sets were very blue green, and and but we also had a lot which had you know a bit of that which was augmenting that quite a lot. Because there's also, and, and again, I'm going to bring up more, there's also these kind of vast murals which appear in various scenes. <laughs> You've got one here behind, or it, this is episode two. Oh, yeah, that's amazing. That's in Kiev. That's, yeah. I mean, yeah. And then, you wouldn't you know, know how hard it was to get the rights to finally show that. Mm. So, I mean you've just got this incredible background made of metal which obviously reflects the light and it's fascinating are these all sets or are they well you've mentioned that wasn't kiev this is the location in kiev um from early on i think it was a discussion about what a fantastic way to open up to it sort of sums everything up at that point and then then it became a real issue to get the rights to show it and eventually did um this is weird, actually, because I found this one in a book and was using it for a reference for ages. And when we were driving around Kiev, we saw it on the side of a wall. I was like, oh, it's here. Um, and then uh, the other one, the carpet. OK, so <laughs> when the we let them in here, it's I've got the carpet. really it's hard to sort. No, 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 the wall on the Brukhanov's oh, office. Um, it's actually really hard to source anything. Um, from the Soviet period in Lithuania and also like things like tiles, things that you think you'd be able to get hold of was difficult. But we did discover that we could print on carpet, which is a really weird thing. And it just became an exciting um, uh, prospect. So the, the, a, lot, a lot of these weird murals are kind of all across the references in the Soviet Union anyway. And we want, I, I don't know, this one was just an idea. Um, I, I mean, we must have shown you all of this stuff, but we were in my head at the time, I just wanted this fractured power plant. Um, the, we knew this scene we wouldn't see till the end. So we would have gone through all of that story beforehand, which was really nice because this scene actually is, um, in terms of time-wise, up front before the plant explodes. And it just seemed like a very nice poetic image. But, um, and obviously the colors, I think Johan often got annoyed with me because I used too much orange, I think. It's one of my favorite colors on screen, but whatever. Um, and this, uh, but yeah, this, this was a total fabrication of creation by our wonderful graphic artists. Um, and, um, and then the one with the gold that you saw, that was in a location. And I mean, essentially that's the best thing in the room. And that uh, was really enticing. I think it was a it was a lot of it was a lot of joy in being able to produce a visual that was sort of an ugly beautiful. It's not an off it's not often you get to do that um, to tell the story. It usually has to or it doesn't have to be, but you know it, it was a rare opportunity. So um, and and it's very indicative of the era as well. Yeah, yeah. I find these examples. Well, I find these pictures kind of good examples on this kind of people talk about the authenticity or, or the realism of Chernobyl. But of course, you know, we all try to create something believable and and, and something real. But I love what the production uh, kind of the part or design um, the part have done to this to this thing, for example, which is. This is not what what it was for real, I guess, but to but they have you kind know, of translated it into into these images or into the set, and um, and um, yeah, I mean I I find that as interesting also in terms of cinematography that you try to get as much information as possible, and of course you want to make something real, but then you yeah, but then you kind of leave that to the side, and then you try to to uh, express yourself somehow and you hopefully that will be in the have the right voice as the, the real history has mm -hmm. but that's how you yeah i guess how, that's how you try to put make it more interesting or or you try to give it a, you know, a new voice somehow mm. and the, the, the kremlin hallway oh that oh, yeah we printed that carpet there, there is the kremlin hallway i think yeah this i this well Jakob, you picked this one but this is a good yeah what you were saying authenticity it wasn't about making a documentary, it was about making something that really, I don't know, 
you again immersive in its authenticity so there were times obviously when you don't want to cross that line of being incorrect because you're dealing with a story that is still very much in people's living minds uh, it wasn't that long ago and there's, there's a time when you want to uh, tell something na narrative or emotionally and 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 this is i mean for some reason don't ask me why this is a rip from a reference it's not the kremlin but this scene in particular i really wanted to make something very anemic and the whole of this and the conference room as well being quite anemic was interesting this moire wallpaper became an obsession it's a fabric that we put up it and then um johan was keen to have something in this i mean no this is all very much johan as well but this Ivan, Death of Ivan, or Ivan the Terrible painting, I've forgotten what it's called now. It just felt like a good fit. It was one of those things, which is like we, we had some ideas and um, showed Johan, we kind of pitched us and we, we went for it. And obviously, of course, it doesn't hang there in the Kremlin. It's, it's not even yeah. vaguely relevant, but it, it sort of sums up historically well at that point, the rise and fall of the Soviet Union. And, um, and it, it's very kind of, it's just there. You can read into it what you like, but for me, it really, it, you know, it's nice. It's like these little nod, <laughs> these understandings between us as a crew as well. <laughs> um, but I do think it, it, it adds, a, adds a, another layer to the story that I wouldn't have otherwise. I, I also find it, inter find it interesting that this is uh, a set, this was built. And if you yes. think of, you can say, oh, well, that's just a corridor. You know, you should be able to find that somewhere in Lithuania or if not, in worst case, in the Ukraine, but we didn't. Or there were some kind of some uh, suggestions, but neither Luke or Johan or you know none of us kind of said, okay, then let's do it here. We, the, you know, the, or, or the director kept saying, together with Luke, that no, this is not good enough. And that's also you know just interesting how how much pressure it is on on kind of on Luke or on Johan to kind of say, okay, well, let's do this corridor. It's not important; it's just a corridor. But they, but they kept fighting for to find the right one, and of course you couldn't find the right one. You had to build it in the end. But it's, it, you know, it's it was really, you know, worth it, I think. And otherwise, um, yeah. But it's yeah. No, it's not correct, Lou. I mean, it, it could have been a really bad corridor. This in in. I mean, oh my God. No, I mean, we were looking at sort of elegant locations. We wanted some sense of wealth, of prestige, this removement, removal from what was happening in, in Chernobyl and those scenes. But, but it was really hard because you don't want it to be gaudy and you don't want it to be classical and, uh, or like look like a corporate hotel. I mean, and, and you end up doing so much work. And then really what you want is something actually quite stylized. So when you if you take this out of the context of the project as a whole, I think it works, but like you, you probably, your head wouldn't go there. You, I mean, this pure, it's pure white, essentially. It was a very bold statement. It's not something you normally would choose to do, but it, it felt good. It felt right. And they, like yeah, I said, a lot of this was a, a, a kind of a collective sense of, yeah, that's interesting. Let's, let's, it, it, and we, and it feels right. And, and at, at that point in the story, I mean, these, Columns we had hand sculpted by a, a local uh, sculptor who just about finished in time. It's one of the last things we shot. Um, we actually took a lot of our lights from real locations. Uh, so these chandeliers are, are from a location. And then, um, yeah, this is a long, a really long corridor set that, that didn't literally connect up to the Kremlin conference room. And although there was something interesting about the jarring. Um, wealth of this space going into this sort of very kind of uh, practical bureaucratic 80s space of the conference room. And I think without that level of control, I think it's very easy, like Jakob says, to give in to the pressures of the, the amount of sets on a TV schedule and, and say like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll do that one and, you know, and that'll work. But actually, collectively, I think it goes back to how passionate everyone was for this project to make something um, unique, I guess. I don't know. I mean, it's easy to look back and say that. <laughs> and, and when it comes to, I think we've already basically covered it, but it, when it comes to things like, you know, colour palette, I'm just trying to find uh, that one. We were very careful with red. I remember that because obviously red's a very indicative communist kind of thing, but we tried to keep it to the flags and the old pots of red. Hmm. 
Um, was this a location, did you say? The that's a location, yeah. I mean, that's fabulous. I mean, nowhere in my wildest dreams would I have been able to dream up those tiles. Uh, it's actually in Gorbachev's villa. So Gorbachev had a villa built in Lithuania. He never lived in it. And, um, and we used a few spaces, not as many as I think we'd end up using, actually. It was a difficult location I mean, in terms of, it wasn't actually that exciting, but we did some of the Hotel Palicia rooms there and we did um, this, which was down in the kitchens. It was like in a washroom and these tiles were just so insane. And, and it's, 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 this is probably one of the few where we went, yeah, well, we sort of can take this as it was because, um, it, again, it's, it's just really a uh, very strong image. Yeah. So I've got to say like, um, the deals, uh, the, the work on that suit, his glasses, is pretty astonishing. <laughs> but <laughs> and this scene where they oh. kind of have their meeting, is this a location or was it the set? That's a, yeah, that's an old school uh, somewhere in Lithuania. That's a location, but again, it's like, um, we actually did quite a lot of work in there to sort of age it back and also put this mural on the window. Um, there was a scene inside a classroom that was that were that was uh, that we did there as well. It was a uh, was actually we did quite a lot of that, didn't we? Yeah, we, we painted this kind of big mural of sunflowers on the stairs. Um, so again, it's like, like you, you you find these spaces. There's something interesting about them, but they, they're never all the way there. So we try to make them work with oh yeah kgb museum so again a location but again dressed by you guys i think what's interesting here Jacob, is how you lit it because the, the real lights in here are these sort of orange uh bayonet bulbs aren't they and that the choice for fluorescence throughout is yeah. i think what makes it show really interesting yeah in many ways i mean especially in the scenes with the army with the, with the soviet army we were somehow concerned that it would look like a Second World War movie or a First World War film, and and um, especially with the warm you know warm light, you know often use these lanterns even here, you know, with a lot of lanterns. But then, so we felt you know we needed to use fluorescence um, in order to help that shift or to help us create an, another period to create you know to create the 80s with the fluorescence, which is also true you know you know in our research or. So at the time, you know, people even had fluorescent tubes in the living rooms, mm -hmm. uh, and so um, so that kind of gave us the um, gave us the motivation to use kind of fluorescence here, I guess. And and but once again, what made this scene amazing to me was that we were on on real ground. We were on, you know this is the old um, Stasi or old Gestapo uh, prison during the Second World War, and then later became KGB's um, uh, kind of prison in Vilnius. So it's a horrible, I mean, there's so much, you could almost feel it in the walls, so much horrible things have been happening in, in this place, where we were filming. And, of, and I'm sure on, on the crew, it, it set the tone, you know, we were not only doing Chernobyl, we also had the, the history of, uh, of uh, Gestapo and of KGB on us while shooting this. And, I don't know how it affected the actors in the end, but surely it affected uh, me when I was shooting this, and you, you know, you took it more seriously, and and um, yeah, so um, yeah, it was a crazy place, really. Well, we we've only got twenty minutes left, so I'm going to quickly run through some of the questions that have come in for you guys during that time. No, I don't um, Okay, here's one for Jakob, and it's from Alfred, who's a graduate. How much did you consider the historical artificial light sources to inform your lighting for night slash interior? Did you opt to light with tungsten fluorescent sources or incorporate newer LED lighting? You partially already answered that. Hmm. Yeah, well, once again, we, we kind of believe that, um, especially when we're shooting Moscow at night, how, does Mos how did Moscow look like in 1986? And I didn't really find any good much pictures of it, but I kind of believe that it was must have been quite dark. Uh, I mean, Stockholm. I'm in Stockholm at the moment, and it's quite a dark city, and it's an old kind of socialistic uh, city. And and I think Moscow was kind of quite dark at the time. And 
and um, and then the bulbs we kind of thought that the bulbs were not frosted at the time they were all clear glass bulbs so that kind of motivated us to use kind of hard lights and at least translate kind of away from from a lot of layers of diffusion and try to use a lot of hard light and um, yeah, so I don't know if I answered the question. So yes, so we use LLDs also. We had to, even though the idea was not to use it, just like the idea was not to have any um, any vintage lenses. We thought of using a lot of uh, tungsten sources, but in the end, we used all kind of technologies to to achieve the, the you know the, the vision. Yeah. I remember we had that conversation oh, early on, though, Jakob, and you said, "What did you say?" Because we were talking a lot about how to visualize something that's invisible, the radiation. And I remember you saying, and this is in there a lot, like um, what you were saying about hard light and this kind of slits of light hitting people. Yeah. Kind of yeah, I mean, you can see that on, that on that mural. That was like, once again, during a scout, we, we saw this mural that you were showing a, a frame grab of, the old Soviet mural. I don't know mm -hmm. if you can find that again, but that was the... Um, there was a mural there and, and that kind of triggered us. I mean, this mural shows a Soviet worker together with the atom in the middle there. And, and, um, and that's the atom in the middle. So the idea was here, you know, this gave birth to the idea that the sun would kind of be the symbol of the radiation of the, the, um, the rays of the atom. So throughout the film, uh, that's something that we, we that was our roadmap, so to speak, that throughout the film, the sun is re representing the, the invisible threat or the, mm. the danger. So, um, so often, I mean, it's uh, quite subtly made, but, uh, you know, the, the worse people got, the more radiation they have in them, the, you know, often the more overexposed they were. So, um, so, um, so that was kind of, a, for me and, and my gaffer or, and our crew, that was our a roadmap how to light the scenes because now we knew what the sun would be you know so for example in this shot here we have mirrors this is a massive mural which is around 50 meters long and we have these big mirrors hitting this because this was on the shades on the north side so we're having the sun kind of bounce into mirrors hitting that atom in order to give the illusion of of uh, overexposure from the atom but if you will ever rewatch the film you'll notice that uh, you know Hopefully, well, not hopefully, but you'll see that the, the, the radiation is really the, the sun in the film. Mm. And that was also kind of based on that we were in Lithuania, that many of our crew members who are Lithuanian, uh, they mentioned that they were not allowed to step out in the sun after the accident. And I said, what do you mean you want to step out? Well, you know, we thought that, uh, that the dust particles that we saw in the sun were the radiations for so some way we were you know we were of course scared of, go, of walking out we stayed inside but suddenly but certainly when the sun was out we were you know extra scared of not to get you know hit by the sun or hit by the radiations so that was a big kind of um, you know lighting cue in the film or throughout the five episodes uh i've got a question for luke uh uh, not related to Chernobyl, but what advice would you give to someone starting with production design in terms of studying and creating a portfolio of film schools? Um, and wanting to be a designer, right? Yes. Yeah, because obviously there's many jobs in the art department. Um, it's, it's really tricky with this bit talking to person. In particular, we had a, a, one last, not last week, it was a few weeks ago with the NFTS students at the moment on the design course. I think the thing is to remember that you often have to lead, these, particularly with these TV projects anyway, you have to lead them. You can't wait for someone to tell you what to do. And, and, and therefore you have to kind of have a sort of strong sense of what you want to do with it. You are, you are often going to spend a year with people that you've never met before doing something for a year that you must really care about so at least try to make it um your version that you want to do i suppose and that goes as much to picking the people that you want to work with as well as the direction you want to take something so um <clears throat> i think always be honest especially if you're going to a meeting or a pitch about a script because you never want to try and give uh, 
this, uh, you know, never want to try and guess what they want to hear. You want to say what you want to say, and then it's whether they want to go that direction or not. Um, and in terms of creating a portfolio, I mean, I think it's about variation. I mean, it depends what you want to do. I, I much hugely advocate working in art departments. I, mean, I did that, but I, I guess I didn't stay in big art departments. I, I did smaller projects and bigger projects, and I met some very interesting designers. I kind of beelined for des to work for designers that, who I like the work of, which I think is a very important thing. Is chances are you'll get on as well. Um, and then always be active and keep your personal projects going as much as possible. I mean, I don't think an agent is an A to B thing. I get asked that a lot. Uh, I think you'll know when it's ready, when that's the time. And I think it's a very tricky relationship. That you you um, grow over time as well. So there is no one short answer, but um, if you want experience in art departments, then obviously the portfolio is, is, is very important. If you, uh, talking about portfolio of making your own design projects. And I think yeah. it's about choosing your projects carefully and, and doing ones that you really care about. I mean, uh, it's, it's actually been really hard since doing Chernobyl because there was a certain amount of layers of satisfaction that you don't get on every project, both working on it and obviously finishing it. So, um, and even I don't know <laughs> when I'll find that again. So, uh, yeah, it, it, without a slightly more specific question, that's all I can think to say to that. But. Okay. Uh, I've got a question for Jakob uh, from Helena. How did you treat each character in terms of cinematography? Do you try to convey the feelings of the characters with lighting and the camera, which was in general your approach about characters? So what was in general your approach? Uh, um, yes, uh, I mean, I think the best part, uh, what I'm most proud of in the film or in the show is are these uh, close-ups or how they, in the edit, how they managed to to keep these close-ups alive or stay for so long. Uh, you know, I think there's some close-ups of if it's a fireman or if it's of an unknown soldier. There are close-ups of them which where the camera is just on them and, and it's there for seconds. And those shots are even longer than the establishing shots or of or the great explosions or whatever. But the, the close-ups of people are, thanks to Johan and thanks to the editors, that they really you know, kept those. And, so, and I'm glad that we were able to shoot those. And, and, that, and they were shot because they, we wanted the camera to be there with them and, and try to be as humanistic as possible with our camera. But but the but the approach for the people as such, I think it was the same approach for all of them, uh, kind of camera approach, uh, and and meaning also that we didn't want to enhance anything. We wanted to be as as um, as you know, not neutral, but as um, as uh, humanistic and show them as much as respect as possible. We didn't want to do any shots under angle, or I mean, we didn't want to interfere with the with their performances or with their characters. We just wanted to portray it as as natural as possible. And the same goes with the light. The light approach was also the same, apart from, like I said before, with the sun. You can see the Sherbina, who is played by Stellan Skarsgård, uh, in the in the courtroom scene. He starts to cough, and then they come out. There's a scene outside, and there they are really overexposed and. And so the sun was always there. And uh, when, when Legasso wakes up in episode one, he wakes up in Moscow. He, he's sleeping in the shade or in the darkness of his room, but you see the sun is entering his bedroom and he's being hit by the sun. And from then on, you can see there's a small augmentation of the, of the highlights on his body mm -hmm. throughout the show. Um, so that was, all, that was like an arc in terms of the light. But in terms of the, the lenses and the camera work, it's, it has yes, tried to be, well, classical is the wrong thing, but we didn't try to want to push, um, push it in any way. We just want the viewer to see it and realizing that this, we're not trying to manipulate you in that sense. Uh, also with the depth of, short depth of field, we didn't want to enter that, of course, a lot of, there's some depth, short depth of field work, but we tried to work on a stop at four and five, six, as in order to see more of the sets, and but also try to make something less um, fashion or stylized. In the end, of course, it becomes a style also, but we try to to almost be boring in a sense, uh, and just let them, you know, take all, take the space for us, and not let the cinematography take too much space. 
Okay. Uh, I've got a, a question which I, you guys may know the answer to. Um, was there a VFX rendition of radiation that was similar to camera noise? Was there a preconception of how sound design would accentuate this, particularly in the first episodes when the audience and characters simultaneously discover radiation? Uh, what meaning that if there's if if it was an effect on the film in real life? Yeah, uh, was there anything the VFX crew did or in sound design to just give the audience the clue that there is this silent killer out of their radiation? Yes, well, I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of flicker in the film. Uh, of course, there are flicker from practicals that starts to flicker, but also we had there are also scenes, daylight scenes, like I'm sitting here in daylight, that are flickering. So we had our, our soft light is often, our soft kind of ambience is also flickering a bit, which we did, which we manipulated in order to give the, the sensation of that something is wrong or there's maybe radiation in the air. And you see it, you can see it, but we saw it even more on set. But of course, when it's been cut, you, you see less of flicker. So in post, in the DI, we often add a lot of flicker to scenes. Uh, of course, it was not enough, even though I thought, my God, I'm we are ruining the scene if we added too much flicker to this scene. But um, so we had the flicker, which was, uh, which was a kind of a, a symbol for the radiation. So there's a scene when he runs up to the very roof of the, um, to the roof uh, of uh, Katya, which is the worst, most radioactive place on the planet. And there you can see it's flickering from practicals, but also when he's approaching the roof and you see it's a big hole in, uh, this big hole in the wall and there's daylight coming through, that daylight, if you, can, if you rewatch it, it is flickering. So we kind of pretended somehow that, that radiation is interfering with the ambience light. And as he runs out and we have this big one take, uh, which is an exterior set, massive set that, that look built with blue screen all around. There I was very lucky, I was praying that we would have some on this day. So that would kind of really tell the story that, and it's over, really overexposed that we have radiation here. But also we had a rain machine on top. I think <laughs> there was a thought of having a rain scene. So then in case we would not have the sun, if the sun wasn't out, because we couldn't light that big set, then we would have a rain scene with this big rain machine. And to that rain machine, we had attached a lot of strobes. So we would have, so we would have the effect of the rain, but also we would have this constant, um, uh, very subtle flickering also to, you know, to give uh, room for the, for, for the radiation. But also the sound is mostly, it's really, the sound is helping us. It's constant there giving, it's not, the sound is not, strobing as such but it's always um, it's a tremor to the sound which really it's, it goes hand in hand with the camera work and that's that's you know, one who has managed to uh, orchestrate that or try to orchestrate the two you know go together or yeah, to be in sync okay. uh leon who's a graduate director asks uh for you both there's a the show's question about truth and what is the cost of lies Going from initial creative thoughts to final execution, what choices did you find making with camera, lighting, color palette, production design to help serve these themes, e.g. characters in space or hard lighting in the trial team? Oh, do you want to? Do you want to yeah, do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. What? Did it, so, so the, the question, question the question basically is what choices did you make with lighting camera color palette and production design to serve the camera uh, to serve the show's main theme which is what is the cost of lies so in terms of characters in the space the framing hard lighting i think uh, that the, that is a very narrative driven theme though what is the cost of lies i think there were other themes that we were more interested in illustrating and that was a sort of um it was not all about the failure of the state as we said before it was actually a lot about um and uh, individual acts of heroism and bravery and, and, and people's stories that was our kind of main focus and then um 
we were looking for, I guess, supporting themes as we went along. I mean, let's take the trial scene as the one. one. I mean, Jakob, you found that uh, reference from The Godfather 2 of that trial scene and that, that sort of sense of reality and constant movement from fans and noise and kind of, you know, that, that, I guess that's a sort of authenticity authenticity that we were after that was more of a narrative authenticity than a literal authenticity although that room is very close to the the real room and there was something very kind of I mean I guess yeah if I think about it there was something very poetic about putting the judges up on the stage and they had to come from behind the curtain it's literally a show trial and and then in uh, in that very sort of essence of that and then I guess everything sort of stems from that. I don't think it was a conscious idea of like, how do we visualize the cost of lies? Because I think Craig wrote that in very clearly. It was much more, how do we tonally achieve this so it doesn't become gratuitous or become uh, self um, indulgent, you know, and, and, and becomes like Jakob said, there were, you know, the design as well it should be, you know, it's obviously one, it wants to be beautiful, but it, it, it it should be backseat to um, this incredible story playing out. So it's a real, that's a very hard question. I mean, and also possibly uh, to, uh, to also at the same time, also to a simpler question to answer, to sum up, because I think at every step of the way we, we are factoring in so many different things. I and mean, like I said, every time we approach any of these projects, you literally build them up as a collage, both on your own and with the other people you're working with until you start to sort of have a rule book where you understand what is right and what is wrong in terms of the context of the project you're trying to achieve. So, yeah, I don't know, Jakob, what do you think? I mean, maybe you had more conversations like that with Johan, but generally with Johan and I was, was more tonal and emotional kind of access, accents on the scenes than anything. Yeah, well, I don't know. Um, I think you answered quite well, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's a tricky question, but but um, yeah, but if you're talking about the trial scene, and if people want to know about the cinematography of the trial scene, it was interesting that we had that was you know the set looked very much like you know, like the real place, and and it was lit by these hard sources, and which it was, it was even the the, the trial was filmed with these I think beta cameras or umatic cameras, That's and they needed cool. lights. So so the lights that we are using on the on our film set are maybe even the lights that we use, we found some old lights from the 1980s. Yeah, the prop lights, and, yeah. And yeah. Pro, so the prop lights, and of course we also enhanced that with our own hard sources, but um, I always want to light, with, always want to light with hard lights, but you can't anymore because people don't believe in it. It looks fake, but, but, uh, but in this case, it looks real, I guess, because that's how it, that's how it was. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, out of interest, were there any references from the director? And I don't mean necessarily photos of Chernobyl, but references to other films or other other pieces of work. Um, one one stands out in particular. He, he um, I not say made us. That's what makes him sound very. Uh, but he encouraged us to watch a film called Come and See, which I don't know if you've seen it. It's a very hard to watch film set in Belarus, but it does have this, it does make a certain idea click into place when you watch it. And I think probably people who watch it will understand why, why it became a sort of bit of a early reference point. Um, there's, aside from them using live ammunition in the film, there's a kind of rawness and reality to it that was really interesting. Um, and then on top of that, I mean, there was, a, there was a full range of constant imagery back and forth, but, but that I remember was very much a kind of early point that both me and Odile watched and, and talked to Johan about. So, yeah, there was a, oh, I mean, there was that a number come of and it. see, did you say? Come and see, yeah. It was a lot of paintings mostly otherwise. It was uh, yeah. this Flemish painter, Hieronymus Bosch, who, oh, yeah. depicts, uh, who depicts hell most of uh, in his work. And that was, um, that was a, yeah, those paints was a big, and he, he, the director, or Johan, he tries to stay away from film references as such, and, and he kind of brags about not, that he hasn't gone to a film school, and I don't know if that's something to brag about, but he, he so it's not as a, of course he's a cineast, but he, he, does, he talk, doesn't talk much about cinema, and, or about films that we should see. And I think Come and See was, it was, uh, I guess it was a reference 
mostly as of, like like Luke said about um, the rawness and about the faces and about seeing the right people and and concentrating on faces and and uh, and the people. So that was a that was a good reference and for the producers, I guess, of HBO to believe in the project or to make them believe more in in his vision. But um, yeah, but Hieronymus Bosch, that was a big kind of um, reference. So obviously, when Chernobyl came out, it was quite a big success. Uh, you must have both been very happy that it had found an audience and such a global audience that it, it had done so well. Um, do you guys have any lasting impressions of, of Chernobyl that you kind of look back on and think that changed me in any way as a filmmaker? Um, I think I think the important thing to know is that when you're making these things, you never know what's going to happen. I think I mean I guess I was not surprised that people liked it. I was surprised that so many people picked it up so quickly. But um, I mean I was talk talking to Jane Featherstone afterwards, and um, she was saying one of the biggest demographics was like 13 to 18, which was like unheard of for that kind of project. And um, so that was a surprise. I think in terms of Megan, I think we knew we were making something really good, I think, because we all write down, this goes for every member of the art department, actually, we're so passionately into it. And then being in that part of the world when you're making it as well, you're, it adds a sort of extra layer of importance. I mean, I'm a big part of the research I probably shouldn't mention earlier is that we were meeting liquidators that who had lived through the period and getting first-hand accounts. And it was, um, it changed your perception, or my perception, certainly, of what, uh, what maybe from the beginning when I had the script to, when we were getting further into the project. Uh, as a designer, has it changed me? Probably not. I think if nothing else, um, it's given me confidence to think more about how, not to take a script necessarily at face value. I mean, the, the difference here is that the script is excellent and, and it is <laughs> pretty much taken at face value, but, but uh, the, the, to maybe not fit the project into parameters on the outset to be to go and achieve as much as you can with it. I mean, it's easy to say that, but both Sister and HBO, I think, treated this very much as a passion project as well at the time. So I guess the thing I missed the most, and I think I alluded to earlier, was perhaps um, the this, comradeship. this team that we had. Yeah, I mean, we all got on really well. We all came from all over. Like Jakob said, we had French sound team, a French ID, a German SFX team. Uh, German producer in Zana is, is amazing, and 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 obviously Johan and Jakob from Sweden, and and I mean it's all it was really interesting. It wasn't, and obviously a huge Lithuanian contingent, and a Ukrainian contingent, and um, having the ability to work uh, on such a long format show with people who are doing every episode obviously means that you then, like, like I said, you talk a lot more, and it's not and it's, it sounds so stupid, but it's rare. Um, that you get to have the kind of creative conversations that actually really do inform the project. And not only do you have to have those conversations, you actually implement them. Um, and, you know, in every piece of model we or concept art that we have, it, you know, it becomes a discussion piece. It, it gets translated. I mean, we moved the whole set, didn't we, Yakov, of the mind, because we realized we couldn't get the shot we concepted. And it's things like that. And it was a really, uh, for me, a hugely satisfying thing that I probably didn't realize until after the project was over and you take stock and you think, I, what, you know, that's what I was saying about these extra layers of satisfaction that, that Chernobyl really had a, a great team. Yes, a great project, great script, but also this sort of extra layer of like reality and importance to a project that you don't always get. So, yeah, I guess it's made me think twice about what to do next and what he says. <laughs> Just, um, it's again a hugely a hard question to answer, but I think every project changes you slightly, probably. I, I, I mean, this is just a curiosity to me, but do you think the fact that you've both done incredibly successfully in terms of awards after the film, after the, the TV show, do you think that acts as a kind of pause for you because you're not sure where to go next? in terms of how do you build upon that? Or do you think it's... it's... I, I can only speak for myself, I mean, but um, 
I don't think any of us set out to win an award for Chernobyl. No. Uh, to make uh, make it as good as it could be. I mean, there's definitely ways to make that show much more generically, and, and we didn't do that. And then, my God, thank God for Johan and, and the support of HBO and Sister Pictures for that, because it, it could have easily gone to a different way. And I mean, I mean, you mentioned sound earlier. I mean, the sound on Chernobyl is, is incredible. I mean, like uh, the choice of the composer, uh, it sounds the whole soundscape is like we're in an analog machine and you know these these kinds of choices are not so common in in, a, in television perhaps so um no no i mean I, I i can understand why the project is so well it sort of, sort of really stood out i suppose as being an interesting project and then the, the award is obviously a, a great thing to be acknowledged that way but no it hasn't i guess it's it's opened up more options, but I don't think actually the award it is more just the show. So, um, and the, and I certainly don't think it changes my perception on what to do next. My, my main goal was always personally as a designer is to do something very different to what I did before. <laughs> Variation is very exciting to me and, and keeps it fresh and different. And, and if it's a good story, then that, that is really is as simple as it gets. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure Jakob would agree. I don't think, I don't think any of us, Still award oh. relevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but the hard the hard part is, I guess, it's on every. I mean, I hadn't done a, such a long project before, mm. um, and but, but it was an I mean amazing project. I mean, the, the was such a great shoot despite the the, the, the topic. But it was it's hard afterwards to uh, suddenly you feel that every project you do has to have a really strong meaning or why you should do this project and and why should you be away and what what's uh, what's the cost of <laughs> what's the cost of being away on a movie and and uh, and uh, and as a dp you can some of us can wander between doing commercial doing shorter you can do commercials and you can do um, you can do that while you wait for the next project but then what should that i mean i don't know i i, I don't think it has changed it's just that you you um, you're realizing more and more that you know it's it's hard to make movies and 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 especially with TV. I don't know if I can do TV again. You know, and, and the idea to um, I love the idea of a five five of doing five episodes or doing one pilot, but to do um, it's hard, I guess, to do TV if you're going to be away for so long. You know, it's such a long stretch. So so um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, okay. I that really. I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we'll wrap it up try and do a quick fire. Uh, this is from Ed. He says, what have you learned in your careers that you wished you'd learned at the NFTS? <laughs> you go first. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know I would live, uh, I didn't know I would, would travel the world, you know, in this, in this way, which I love, but it's also kind of not a curse, but it's also, it's, you know, I didn't know that, you know, I, I, uh, I left, I left, I went to film school because I wanted to work in a film studio. I didn't want to travel all around in Sweden, which I was doing all the time. I was going and shooting these episodes in, in a different city every day. So I thought, let's go to film school and let's work in a studio where I can concentrate on one thing and I can stay put. But, <laughs> but that didn't happen. I mean, it happened, but then I kept going to other film studios all over the world. So, so that's what the school didn't tell me that, what kind of vagabond life it is and what a beautiful life it is also. It's extremely rich life, but I didn't know about that. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, a, a lot of things, a lot, a lot of things. I mean, you spend a, 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 two years, we're talking about the two years at the NFTS went very quickly. I mean, it's a lot to achieve in two years. Um, and a lot of technical skills to achieve in two years. I guess I'm very fortunate. I always knew I wanted to design. I mean, it was a, a no-brainer goal for me in that sense. I, I loved working in art departments, but I knew I wanted to design. So I guess what I didn't learn, I, I mean, okay, two things. One, you have an assumption, or certainly when I went to film school, that you should be aiming for movies, which is fine. But I was a very beneficial point and I think the reason I've been able to do Chernobyl and stuff like that is that I, there was a real boom in TV that's obviously still coming in. And what I've learned since is the, the TV is more of a producer's medium largely. And, um, and in this, for a designer, can be a lot more creative. You can come on a lot earlier, sometimes before 
the script is even finished or, or even begun. And, um, and it loves this quite a vast canvas design wise, but um, it's still, uh, you know, it's, it's, a good, it's not a massively different experience, but it is a different experience of doing a film. So that, that's something for sure. I wouldn't, you know, I'm not sure anyone does sneer, sneer at uh, television, certainly this kind of scale of television, but I, I think there are some fantastic stories and scripts out there that, that play out over a long format. And the reason they're fantastic is because they can be more character based. So that, that is something I, you know, I think should definitely be brought up more film schools, certainly in the design department. Um, because design is, is, the thing is, it's like, it's very easy to see or be treated like it's a, a shop or a providing service, which, you know, it is, but it's, it's not, I mean, we're all filmmakers and, um, and for me, it's always a story. So the thing that I think everyone who's at the film schools in whatever course is the story first. Um, and then, you know, and then your discipline, in my opinion, anyway, that, that is something I would love to see being said more in a film school. Um, because I think uh, we, all, we all have a responsibility to tell that story. Um, yeah. But I mean, I, like Jakob says, I mean, I, I guess I didn't really think about the travel aspect. I, I think it's an absolute joy of the part of the job although probably it's not going to happen so much at the moment. <laughs> Seems to have quite a few restrictions placed on my current project, but that stops me going abroad. But um, the, yes, uh, I mean, it is an endless list, but I, I think, yeah, if, if that sums it up, that is what I would say. Well, thank you both for joining us today. It's been great to hear about Chernobyl and your time at the NFTS and everything. Stay well and safe, and we'll yeah. we will meet again. We will, sure. Yakov. Sure. We will give you the Sue Gibson Award at some point <laughs> when we can actually get to the school to get the award and get to you. Thank you. And Luke, I promise you, we'll have dinner like at some point in 2021, maybe, uh, uh, and not virtually. Maybe we yeah. can have it in a yes, glass cube in, exactly. in a restaurant. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very much. Everyone in chat is currently saying thank you to you guys. If you have a look, oh, um, thank, thank you. you thank you. It's nice to see you, you guys. That's something that we did two years ago. <laughs> Take care, and I will see you all soon. Bye, okay. everyone. Thanks, Duncan. Thank you, Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Thanks, Bye. 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 Bye, Luke.